Great. Well, thank you all for coming today. Um, can you hear me okay? All right, great. Um, I'm Carol Burroughs. I'm the Chief Data Officer for the State of North Carolina. I support the Data Division, and Tim and the GIS team are part of the Data Division. So I'm here today to talk to you about data, all things data, not just GIS data. Come out of your shells, get away from the GIS data for a moment, and let's think about all data, right? And government by nature is in the, is in the data collection business. What a wealth of information we all have at our fingertips. It's the power and the knowledge that we need to derive from that data and make better informed decisions. So my team is a team of evangelists. You've heard Tim and his team and all of you evangelize in the use of GIS data. I would also say that the administrative data is equally as important. And if we can layer that together, and I'll get to that later on in this um, short talk, the power is going to be enormous. So I want you to be energized and I want you to ask questions. Feel free, interrupt me. Um, so what is the data division? Our data division, his mission is simple be a leader in enabling and sharing of data. Pretty simple, right? Our mission is to transform that data into information. How do we make it usable for our business units, for our legislature, for our local governments, to understand what that really means? My team, as I said, I have the Government Data Analytics Center. We have the Center for Geographic Information Analysis. We have the Health Information Exchange, which is all the clinical records from all the providers in the state flowing through our organization and sharing it to other providers. We have the Longitudinal Data Service, which is looking at data over time. What does that message tell us? So it's a great team, it's an energized team, and we have so much work. We need your municipalities, your towns, we need everyone to come together and think on how we can use this data. One of our missions in our organization is to build it on an enterprise level. We love to hear about business problems, and we love to build at an enterprise level. Share it with everyone. Secure it so you can see only your data if we need to, or share it with everyone if it makes more sense. So keep that in mind as you're thinking of new opportunities for data and analytics and how you can drive new and innovative, innovative approaches. One thing I will say is data is shared at the speed of trust. As you all were, are supplying information to NC1MAP, there's a trust factor there. You know the data is going to be quality, you know that it's going to be representing you well, and you trust our organization to keep that data safe and protected and available as you deem appropriate. When we start talking about administrative data, it gets even more important because we're talking about my data, your data, everyone's data in this room, and how we need to protect it and ensure the privacy of all. So trust with your business owners, trust with everyone is so important as we navigate this world of data. And it's coming in so fast, we can't even control it all. <clears throat> so how do we do that? When we look at data analytics, it's like building a house. There's a foundational concept, right? We need leadership and stewardish, stewardship and accessibility across our organization. That's the foundational point. Someone needs to lead us. What business problems are we trying to solve? And as we all know in the GIS community, metadata is so important. Data quality is so important. We need our addresses to be correct. We need to make sure that the data that we're using, and, it, and not all data is going to be clean, most data is not going to be clean, but know where those anomalies are, and that's where the metadata comes into play. And we need common identifiers. How do we link it? It's really easy with mapping. You guys can put a point on, on a chart, and we know how to do that. With the administrative data, it gets even more complex. How do we link someone that's receiving a social service over here with another, with that social service in another organization. So it becomes even more complex when we talk about administrative data. The other thing that we have to think about, as I mentioned earlier, is that trust factor, privacy, and the security of that data, and the hierarchy, which comes first. Who has the best address on an individual to help that individual out? Um, what 911 is using address NC, they're saying that address is the, is the correct building location of where they're going to send that, 
emergency unit. In Medicaid, they're looking at how do we serve that population? Do we have enough providers in that area to serve our, our Medicaid population? So all of this becomes important to the business and the organization. The last thing is the easy part. We're all in technology. It's easy to manipulate data. We can tell a story with data. We all know how to do that. Um, it's about what tools we use. So I would like you to flip out of your tool mentality and think about the business problem first, and then what tools do we apply to bring that data to life? And really, we're telling a story. And that gets us to our data-driven government, which we all want. <clears throat> so as I sat to prepare for this presentation, I sat with Tim and I said, hey, Tim, tell me about NC1 Map, because I haven't been around um, through your journey um, just recently. Um, have I taken on the role of, of chief data officer? And he said, well, Carol, NC1 Map has been around thing, since 2008. And I said, so has the GDAC. That's what I was doing in 2008. And as we aligned it, we're going on these parallel paths facing the same problem. So if you see on this chart here, NC1 Map had an implementation plan. The GDAC had a strategic plan for data integration. Imagery came about. Criminal justice data integration, some of you may have heard the application CJ Leads. We built this integrated model of all criminal justice data to solve a business problem where criminal justice professionals didn't have all the information at their fingertips. It would take 10 minutes to try to look up an offender to understand whether they had a warrant and whether they're a good bad guy or a bad person or whatever. So we built this application and then we just kept growing. We did fraud and compliance. Um, CGIA and NC1 map went into parcels thanks to you all, thanks to the local communities bringing data together. Then we went into the health information exchange, which is all the provider clinical records coming through, and you guys drove address NC. So we're on the same path, we're on the same journey, we have mapping and we have administrative data all coming together. The challenge I have for you all is how do we bring this together and start using each other's data in a better, more informed decision-making models. <clears throat> so we talk a lot about, in GIS, the mapping. The administrative data maps as well. The layers and the changes over time tell us a story. So how can we get, I almost want to say, shuffle the deck. One side is GIS data, one side is administrative data. How do we mix that together and tell our story? Um, because it's a richer, better story when we get there. So that's your challenge. I don't have the answers. Um, Tim and I, Tim's team and, and the G, uh, GDAC team, we always have these discussions. We meet and we get all fired up and it's like, okay, how do we do this? How do we get this? How do we start driving some things, data together to be, be better informed? Well, in the anal analytics side, when we start pulling the data, and it's probably the same on the GIS. There's a maturity model, right? I like to say we crawl and then we walk, we run, and then we soar. We always want to be soaring, but we have to get, we have to start somewhere. We have to start a path. And it's ever evolving, it's ever changing, just like we've heard it throughout this conference. Keep learning, keep driving. And as slowly as you start to learn things, you will start to drive better and more informed decisions. You'll, you'll start that curiosity will build. So in the crawl stage, it's what's happening. Plot it on a map. Here's our, here's our COVID cases and here's where we're being impacted. Tactical, what's happening? Oh, we're seeing a growth over here. There's something happening, but we don't really know what. We haven't driven to that, expo that piece yet. What will happen? Those gets into the predictive modeling. Well, if we can look at things over time and we can look at outliers, we can start to predict the future. So we know a storm is coming. I'm sure you, you have some models that do this. What do we think that storm surge is going to do to that land mass? And where do we need to make sure that our, our citizens move? And by the way, when they move, what resources from our um, administrative systems need to be available? If we have folks that are moving for a hurricane, we need to make sure that they have um, access to health care. So we need to make sure our, our um, health information exchange is going, right? 
We need to make sure that it, they might need some other social services. They might need more access to uh, pharmacy, pharmaceuticals. So all of that plays a part as we start to look at the data as it gets intertwined. And then dynamic. How can we make things happen? How can we affect change? What can we do? What can we do in a real-time mode? And I sat and listened to the city of Raleigh and what they're doing in traffic. Wow, we're at the crawling stages, right? We're going to start, so I can see that soaring as we start to look at that data over time and we see the impact to an intersection or traffic patterns, or perhaps we need to, with everyone moving into a state, start looking at expanding that intersection to serve more traffic or stop the flow of, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, stop the, um, I lost my train of thought, sorry about that. Uh, you know, the traffic patterns and the flow of um, incidents, perhaps accidents, et cetera. <clears throat> when it comes to health care and safety, we meet with our officers and our local, um, our law enforcement agencies often understand how we can use data. Um, sure, you can look at crime statistics and map it, but can you predict that potential crimes might happen in a certain area based upon historical knowledge? <clears throat> so let's talk about some things that we've done in our data analytics center as we've um, developed and matured over time. We've done uh, what's called entity resolution. So we have an API that can actually match records across um, multiple domain areas. So we know if we want to serve a citizen, we know, a little, we know how to match that citizen across different domain areas to support them. <clears throat> we have um, business dashboards, how much, how many, a lot of uh, various pieces. We do data exchanges and interoperability. Um, hey, I need, I, you know, I'm trying to get this person into, <clears throat> into Medicaid. I need these answers from these applications, and we can give that information out. <clears throat> from a walking perspective, fraud analysis is very large in our organization. We do a lot of fraud modeling and identity theft protection for all of us in this room. When COVID hit, um, we had to be agile and start to turn the tables and look at the data coming in for individuals that were applying for unemployment. And when those unemployment applications were coming in, a lot of stolen identities were coming in as well. So we did a lot of that work as well to bring that data and to protect the citizens from not, you know, my, there actually were some colleagues of mine whose identities were in unemployment. They were working for the state, but someone had stolen their identity. So <clears throat> it was a good, it was a feel good thing. But then we started to look at pockets of where these addresses were and what we found if, when we started mapping it was there were pockets, apartment buildings, one through 80. They all applied for Medicaid on the same day, or the unemployment on the same day. A little odd. So when, again, when we start looking at this data combined, we start to see better patterns. So if I can leave you with anything, I really want you to think outside of your limits and start talking to your business owners to understand where and how we can bring this data together to help them. <clears throat> um, from a longitudinal perspective, cradle to grave or workforce, how do we look at an individual and ensure that they're health, they have a healthy, safe, and prosperous experience in North Carolina? Well, a lot of times we're measuring the effectiveness of programs. Where did they go to school? How did they, what programs did they take? And how are they in the workforce? Are they being, um, are they happy, I don't want to say happy, but are they showing that they are being, uh, contributing to our community? Not looking at individuals at one thing, we're looking at the aggregate. Um, so that's an interesting point, but then we also could apply maps on top of that. How do we, how do they look and where do they, where are they located in our state? And how do we look at those underserved communities? Broadband's doing a lot of that and we'll continue to work on that. But again, think of those things as in your communities, how can this help? <clears throat> From the merging of geospatial and administrative data, 
I think we're in the crawl walk stage. Perhaps some of you are running and, and soaring um, and, and, and share that with us. Share in your community. Let's get everyone soaring with the merging of data. <coughs> I, I'll show you a few maps that I, I know of, and you probably know many more. This is Medicaid beneficiaries' access to primary care providers. <coughs> Why is this important? Excuse me. This is telling us where do we need to go out, do outreach to provider communities to get more providers to, to associate and help our Medicaid participants. Very important. Healthcare is important. Um, <clears throat> this one here, let's see. Not working. Maybe. We'll try this. We're stuck. No. Okay, well, there's only one more slide. We'll just keep going. Um, so <clears throat> the uh, slide down here is uh, geospatial broadband. I think you might have seen some other pieces on broadband. And the last one over there is a combination of our um, clinical records and, and um, locations of where COVID, where we're seeing spikes in COVID and looking at it at the county level. Now, we weren't waiting for a COVID test when, when everything was blowing up. We're actually examining the data as, it, as people were being presented in the hospital. And we were looking at symptoms of individuals being presented before they even got their test. And we could look and say, okay, there is an outbreak here in this hospital. They might need more PPE or they might need some more services or their beds are going to be overrun. So we started to look at it. And that's, that's the, the soaring, right? How can we help an organization when they're in need? How can we, when we're faced with a hurricane or a disaster, how do we get there and how do we bring our data together? So that last piece probably was a little bit of soaring. I don't want to, I don't want to put too, too much pressure on the team because this was something that we pulled together based upon an emergent need that was, that we were all facing. So my question to you all is, what, what do you think is out there? What, what possibilities do we have? Where can we go next? How can we drive data? And I'd love to hear from you all. Any thoughts? <laughs> Just me? I like Tim? <laughs> This one here, um, I think the broadband is public right now. Uh, this one here is internal at the moment, but certainly could be public information um, as long as we're protecting the, the citizen data behind the scenes, looking at it from the aggregate perspective. The last one there was an internal dashboard uh, because it did drill down into the patient level data, but it certainly could be something that we could put out for uh, consumption. It depends. The way we work with our agencies is what, what do they want to share um, at an <clears throat> aggregate level to be identified. Um, right now, I'm, I'm starting to talk with Wake County on familiar faces, those individuals that have been supposed to be in our firm, you know, frequent flyers with our big maps in our um, law enforcement agency. So as we start to talk with Wake County about that process, uh, we'd like to As we, as we build a good pilot, why not see how we can get that to serve them, right? Because everyone has the same needs. We're all in the same boat. Maybe we can together build um, a solution that we support all. But more of an perspective, you know, have flawed capabilities where um, restricting access to certain counties for their information. I think it's, it's the benefit to all. So we're open to anything. Um, love to hear your ideas.
So as you talk about going off that maturity model in your academia, you have folks who are trying to do what you've already done. Do you have any advice on um, people processes, relationships that we can kind of bring you back to other organizations? Yeah, I mean, certainly relationships are number one. on how um, you can work with your organization and feel free to reach out to us if you haven't started working yet. Um, my information and contact information is on this uh, PowerPoint as well as our enabling legislation. So one of the things I didn't mention is um, the GDAC, EIS, and the Health Information Exchange as well as our longitudinal team all have enabling legislation which makes it a little bit easier for us to share data. So that helps us, and that's why we're here to help you as well. So we have this legislation that's giving us a little bit of a boost to allow to say, hey, we trust them. They're going to lock your data down. Don't worry. So um, take a look at that legislation. If you can, this PowerPoint, I'll grab the YouTube and you should be able to see that. If not, I have to be happy to see. Thank you very much, Carol.